Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, my name is Eric Miller. For anyone who uh, maybe we haven't seen each other for a while, <laughs> um, I I'm here, you know, um, as part of the committee at Antioch for, uh, for uh, what is it? Uh, Deliberative Democracy and Social Justice Committee, which is working on kind of this main group on campus that uh, deals with everything internal and external for uh, diversity issues. Um, and uh, Kevin Magruder and Myla Cooper uh, lead the committee, but neither of them could be here today, so they asked me to be here. Um, and so just to say welcome and to introduce Carmen Lee, uh, who's um, joined up with the uh, human uh, group uh, in town. And I'll let you introduce yourself a little more. OK. Hi, everybody. Thank you for showing up. Um, oh, use the microphone for the camera. Microphone? It's a mic. Yeah, check. <laughs> Hello. Um, anyway, so thank you for everybody um, showing up. I know there's a lot going on in town. Um, uh, let's see, kind of my main impetus for this whole thing, um, I was talking earlier about, I used to live in Springfield, Ohio, and I worked for the Department of Job and Family Services in Springfield um, in Clark County. And it's located on Lagonda Avenue in Springfield. Lagonda Avenue is pretty um, economically depressed, but it is very culturally and ethnically diverse. Um, when I first started working there, we only had one Spanish-speaking caseworker. Now there are two, and that was like five years ago. Um, but the thing that struck me is that people were coming in and asking what to do if there's a raid at their workplace. So a lot of the people that were coming in to get services were undocumented. There were a couple of things that the county had available for people that were undocumented. Um, but the main question was, uh, what happens if I'm taken away from my children and my family? A lot of these people worked at Dole. Dole has a um, really big, undocumented worker you know population people that are employed there and nobody had an answer nobody had an answer for me nobody had an answer for these people no one had i state was like we don't know the county we don't know um i wasn't satisfied with that so what i started doing is just kind of hooking up individuals with families that i knew in the area that were already established um then i quit um, and then more recently, there were a group of us um, at one of the original human uh, members' homes who um, is pretty active in, in town. Um, human, in case you don't know, is actually recognized by the state of Ohio again as a nonprofit. We don't have federal status yet, but we're working on it. Um, and you know, there, there's more to come on that. But anyway, we were having a meeting and talking about what we can do to kind of build community or inform people of their rights. And I um, am interested in this. I'm interested in you know, criminal justice too, what people, what people need to know in order not to, to panic um, and in order not to be taken advantage of. Saying all this to say, that was in June. What happened a couple, three weeks ago happened here, and what better time than now is what I thought. So I put some stuff on Facebook. I wasn't even sure if Brian would even come. I haven't talked to him in like 13 or 14 years. Um, but I wanted to make sure that there was an interest before I started begging people to come talk. Um, but mo you know, most importantly, I, it's really important that people do not panic, because when you're in a panic state, um, you act irrationally, 
there was vitriol on the internet, there was you know people talking about their neighbors, and we can't have that. So that's why I wanted to do this. There's probably something I'm forgetting, um, but it doesn't matter because it's a very small group and I'll catch you all individually. This is Brian DeFranco. You want to talk about yourself? So I have to use this so yeah, it gets better. Okay, so uh, how close does it have to be? That's okay. Basically, I've um, been in the immigration law realm probably since about 2003. So I don't know, that, how many how many years is that? 16 years. I've been defending immigrants, and um, it's been a up up and downhill type of situation depending on who our current administration is. And you know, people um, people have a lot of um, misconceptions about what they hear, um, both on the TV, radio, um, you know, social media. Um, one thing that I think is good to dispel across the board, when we're dealing with individuals who have entered the United States illegally, which I think is probably the motivation of this talk, okay? anybody who has sought to enter the United States through an illegal means, if they are discovered, they are immediately placed into removal or deportation proceedings. That is the law. Title VIII of the United States Code is the Immigration and Nationality Act. It is federal law. It hasn't changed much in probably the last 50 years, um, but essentially it, it dictates how we treat an individual that we find in the United States who either entered without being legally inspected or who came legally and then remained beyond the time that they should be here. So that body of law, the Federal uh, Immigration and Nationality Act, Title VIII of the U.S. Code, is actually civil law. It's not criminal. Um, just like Title 26, the tax code, is a civil code. The only part of the title of, of the federal codes that are criminal are Title 18. So Title 8, the Immigration, Immigration and Nationality Act, dictates a civil type of legal process and a civil penalty in the form of you are set to your home country. That's essentially the penalty. So <clears throat> where things get a little bit confusing is that an individual in the United States who let's say is either somebody who entered illegally to begin with or somebody who entered with a visa and then overstayed, they're subject to that jurisdiction and they're still subject to normal jurisdictions for their daily life. So if an illegal immigrant or a once legal, now illegal immigrant breaks the law in city X, they're subject to state law and then there is the opportunity for the federal authorities to discover their whereabouts and then take them to federal jurisdiction to, to basically um, face the music for the immigration violation. Um, and I think that's kind of what people here are interested in. <laughs> yeah. Is this one? Yeah. Okay, so you said that if they're discovered that, um, you know, under state law, that uh, the feds may come in, may, okay? All right, so what if they're discovered by the feds? Do the feds turn them over to the state? I mean... O only if the person has committed a, a state law violation. Okay. Now, if the only violation you're suspected of is illegally entering the United States, then the only agency that's going to deal with you is going to be the Immigration and Customs Enforcement officials. But if you are suspected of I don't know, a drug-related crime. It's gonna be whether or not it's gonna to go to the county prosecutor or whether the DEA is gonna get involved if it crosses state lines. Oh, I see, thank you. Were there any other questions at this point? Okay, back to, back to Immigration Law 101. So, a common talking point that everyone hears, both from politicians and in the media is, well, why can't these people just do it the right way. 
<laughs> Problem. Our law permits per year 68,000 guest workers in a non-degreed status per year for a maximum of nine months. So our guest worker program, which is known as the H2 program, H2A and H2B, H2A is for agriculture, H2B is for seasonal non-agriculture, is capped, 68,000 per year to do all of the types of jobs that we need heat type uh, performance for. So who fills those people? Who, who are we gonna find? So our, our legislators have not seen fit to create a workable, sensible guest worker program. Because if you were to take a poll of the average illegal coming from any country south of the United States, if they had the opportunity to work in the United States for six or seven months out of the year, and then spend the remaining part of the year at home with their families, they do it in a heartbeat. But our policymakers have not yet gotten wise to that. Most of Western Europe does something very similar. You can go to the UK and work as a guest worker for six months from practically anywhere. Make some money, go home, integrate that economy, integrate your home economy, it makes a lot of sense. But we don't have that written into our laws. So employers can't simply say, hey, I want this unskilled worker from another country to come and do what I can't find people to do in my community. It doesn't happen that way. And so the majority of people who come to the United States and fulfill jobs of that nature have to do it by violating our law at the border, which is entering without a visa. I mean, that's just, it's reality. We can't undo the, the flow of human traffic across the border. The question then becomes, how do we deal with it once we're confronted with it? So, and I think, I think that's where um, people have to be more rational and more uh, understanding about the motivation to begin with. The motivation for the average person to come to the United States is not to commit further crimes. The average motivation is, I want to support my family. And in most cases, you're supporting an extended family. You're, you could be supporting sisters, nephews, nieces, cousins. You could be supporting a lot of people back home. And the earnings that you make at a minimum wage job in the United States could be feeding 10 or 15 people back home. That's the motivation. The motivation is not one of criminality. The motivation is one of survival. So if you understand it, I think you can better address it. Um, going back to federal involvement, whenever somebody is suspected of being in the country without status, this is where things get a little bit blurry. The Immigration and Nationality Act, the law, results in regulations being written on how we enforce the law. So in every part of American life, the law is the law, and the regulation that is written about the law is how the agency involved administers that law. So the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency has regulations by which they enforce the Immigration and Nationality Act. Some of those regulations involve the ability to stop somebody and inquire about their immigration status. The regulations very clearly say that they can ask any person if they suspect that person has recently entered the United States illegally their status. That's the caveat. They have to have a suspicion that the person has recently entered illegally to do the stop and the questioning. But in most cases, they don't have that suspicion. They just stop and ask. Now, does the regulation or the statute require the person being questioned to answer? Absolutely not. It is a voluntary interrogation. So as with any legal proceeding, the right to remain silent is sacrosanct. It has not changed. The continental United States is still governed by the Constitution. You still have the right to remain silent. So um, when confronted with an immigration agent saying, where are you from? Where were you born? Show me your document. You don't have to 
if you are in that position. You can remain completely silent and you don't have to show them a single piece of information. That's the voluntary nature of the interaction. This card is a very interesting little piece of information as well, telling you not to open the door if immigration's knocking. Why? Immigration does not have the ability to enter a house without a warrant. If they have a warrant, they're not knocking. <laughs> if there's a warrant, the door's coming down, okay? So the knocking on the door is a way to receive consent to enter the premises. Knocking in a very um, aggressive manner, appearing in a very aggressive way, that's the normal way that ICE agents get entry to a home. The moment the door opens, they're permitted to go inside and begin asking questions. But you, on the inside of the door, can leave the door locked. You can even wave at them through the window. And they're powerless to do a single thing about it. Because their entry to the house, if it's warrantless, has to be by invitation. They cannot be without the consent of the, uh, the person at the door or in the building. Okay, so, I have a question. And that is that, let's say that they open the door but there's like a screen door and they've not given verbal or physical, they're just opening the door and looking, is that considered consent by some it, wild stretch of the imagination? It's going to depend on the ICE agent. This is now we're getting into a subjective area. So each ICE agent deals with a situation differently. So one ICE agent may look at the opening of the exterior door as you breached, you breached the opening, I can now come in. Other ICE agents may not do that. So Even it's, though there is no permission to set foot on the property. Opening the door is the permission. So that's why the do not open the door is in bold caps. <laughs> it should be that way. Don't ever open the door for any immigration officer because nine times out of ten immigration officers are not there because they know about a particular individual I've been doing this for 15 16 years I've seen a lot of tactics that immigration officers utilize one tactic that they utilize is they'll have a, an arrest warrant for person A and they'll walk up to the door and knock and say hey we're looking for this guy oh and by the way where are you from it just became voluntary. So they use a warrant for a legitimate bad person as a subterfuge to get you to talk, to get you to interact somehow. And most people coming from a third world country don't know that they can be quiet. Go ahead. I'm trying to understand how the fifth applies. In other words, if once I start answering, I have to keep on going. I mean, I've given, once I, I'm trying to understand how the Fifth Amendment applies. Once I start answering the uh, the immigration person, the ICE agent, uh, any anyway, yeah, you're fine. Whatever. You're okay. Fine. Then I have to keep going. Is it, it? No. No. Just just like in a criminal context, you can end the question anytime you want by invoking your right to remain silent. Okay. But one thing, one one of the problems that's different from a normal criminal setting to the immigration setting is the difference in the type of statute. In a criminal case, the prosecutor and the police have to get evidence beyond a reasonable doubt of your guilt because it's criminal. Our criminal justice system is, it's the government's burden to prove you committed the crime to that 99% certainty. Because immigration is civil law, the burden shifts to the immigrant to prove that they're here legally wow. in a court setting, okay? So for an ICE agent to basically draft a charging document accusing somebody of deportability for being here illegally, they only have to establish that person was not born in the United States and did not enter legally. 
because nobody who's Caucasian or from Europe gets deported. This, but because nobody from from Europe or who's Caucasian gets deported, by definition, this is a racist uh, operation. Who they even suspect? I mean, they don't. You know, I am not. I've never been asked my immigration status. You know, I'm average white boy, and I don't think I ever will be. I am pretty sure that if I were Hispanic, which my stepson is, it does happen. And I'm saying, isn't there, well, define how this isn't racist. <laughs> it looks like it does, walks like a duck. It probably is a duck. But we can't actually call it a duck unless we know the motivation of the person asking the questions. So, and th this then brings us to the next dilemma. The next dilemma is if I am stopped and questioned by state actors, local police, county sheriff, highway patrol, and if there's a suspicion that I've committed a crime, they have to have that unarticulable suspicion to continue to talk to me or gather evidence. Once an immigrant is confronted by somebody of authority, the authority figure kind of relies on the lack of understanding of silence. And they, they sadly are even given bad information by their home embassies. Okay. We are here in centralish Ohio. So anyone south of like Marion, if you're from Mexico, you have to go to Indianapolis to use that consulate. If you're from North, you've got to go to Detroit. All the consulates tell Mexicans, we'll issue you this ID. It's a consular ID. It has your address, it has your name, it has your photo, and it has your place of birth, your date of birth, and your nationality. We recognize you as a Mexican citizen. That consular ID, they're told by their home country government, carry this at all times. Well, if an ICE agent comes up to you and says, let me see your ID, you don't have an Ohio driver's license. You don't have anything with your photo on it except this document. Their job is to gather evidence that you're not an American citizen to accuse you of being deportable. So if you hand them the ID that your home government told you to carry, they've just identified you as having been born in Mexico. Now they can basically place you in deportation proceedings if your fingerprint records don't demonstrate that you cross the border legally with a visa. So we tell people all the time, don't listen to your home governments. The Guatemalan embassies or the, the consulate for Guatemala up in Chicago does this. Honduras, El Salvador, all the concepts that you use consular IDs. Biggest mistake on the planet to carry. Every single person that walks into my office, I tell them the same thing. Do not carry a single document on your person that identifies you as having been born in a foreign country. Because if you hand that to an ICE official, you've just proven their case with them not doing any work. Period. Okay? I guess, I guess the best way the best way I can almost get to your underlying issue is by giving you some war stories. That's probably the best way to do it. So I instruct a lot of my clients, don't carry anything with you and don't say a word. If you're confronted by anybody, remain completely silent. So I had a client who was um, illegally in the United States from Mexico. He was married to a United States citizen and the two of them owned a construction business where she always drove and he always sat in the passenger seat. And I had instructed him on multiple occasions of the necessity of not carrying an ID and the necessity of remaining completely silent. So one afternoon I was driving from Cleveland back to Columbus and my cell phone just blows up and it's the wife. She's on the side of the road. She's on Route 270, which is the outer belt around Columbus. And she said, I was just pulled over by county sheriffs. I'm on the side of the road right now. 
They're talking to me through the window, and an ICE agent just came and took my husband out of the passenger seat. Just took him. Didn't ask any questions. The ICE agent was there with the county uh, sheriff. They were conducting a traffic type stop. And then while the county official was talking to the driver of the American citizen through the window, ICE agent came and just grabbed him and threw him into a van. And I told her, I said, just relax. If he remembers his training, we'll be fine. So about an hour later, as I was making my way from Cleveland, I get a call from one of the, um, one of the officers in charge at the Columbus um, ICE office. And he's, he's a really, really, really nice guy, very straight shooter. And he said, hey, Brian, we got one of your guys. He's refusing to talk. I'm like, yeah, well, that's his right. <laughs> There's a reason he's refusing to talk. is because he's talked to a lawyer. He knows his rights. He said, well, you know, we're going to just fingerprint him. And if he's clean, we're going to let him go. Right, so I called the wife. I said, be outside the, the immigration office in about a half an hour. He's, he's being cut loose. And that was something that was an eye opener for him. Because when I got him back to my office, I said, tell me what happened after they got you out of the car. Well, they threw me into a van with a bunch of other guys from Mexico, and the ICE officers just kept yelling at me and screaming at me and telling me I'm stupid. If I don't tell them where I'm from, I'm going to go to jail for six months, and I'm never going to see my family again. And they just made me feel like I was doing the wrong thing by doing what you told me. Said, but at the end of the day, the other guys in that van proceeded to a jail and got deported because they told them I was born in Mexico. They fingerprinted you, found no evidence that you're a Mexican citizen. So facially, I may think you are born in a foreign country, but unless I can prove it, my case just blew up. So those ICE officers, strong arm tactic on my client, failed, and he's a green card holder today. Go ahead. Do the laws or the regs or procedures or policies created by the agency permit um, abusive behavior toward people in custody and or um, people that are suspected of wrongdoing? It well, once again is subjective because ICE agents, well, let's this close after the 9-11 anniversary, we can take a little walk down memory lane. Before 9-11, immigration authority was under the Department of Justice. Okay? Department of Justice held the INS. Subsequent to 9-11, we created this super agency called Department of Homeland Security, which assumed roles of Customs and Border Protection, Immigration Enforcement, Immigration Benefit Adjudication, they took the Coast Guard. They took all a bunch of other groups and put them under the, yeah, Coast Guard is no longer Department of the Military. Yes, Coast Guard, Coast Guard is now Department of, of Homeland Security and the Transportation Security Administration, which is a conversation for another day. So we made this super huge watchdog agency and we gave them all kinds of powers and we slapped it together practically overnight. So within the first few years, you had legacy INS officers who were thrown into the new immigration service along with former customs officials whose only job was to take care of monetary taxation issues at borders for importations. And now they're all enforcing the same group of deportation laws. So was there a learning curve? Absolutely. Did did and do abuses happen? Yes. You cannot take the human element out of law enforcement. That's just that's a reality. Okay, then I have a follow-up question. Is are there um, is there an avenue to pursue like abuse, you know, to file complaints to um, or and if, even if there is a venue for that? Is it just a joke? The, the venue in this case would be an administrative one. So essentially you're complaining to a separate office in the very same agency that you're complaining against. But that would be the same thing if you were complaining against the IRS. 
<laughs> if you were complaining against any other federal agency, the first, the first level of protection is a group within that same agency that's set up to investigate abuses of that agency. So yeah, it exists. Okay, and, then I have another question. Yeah. Where is the oversight? In DC. Over all of this. Over all of, remember, <clears throat> department. What is the oversight? <laughs> it changes depending on who's the cabinet secretary. Okay, so can you give us an example of what would be the oversight? I mean, um, let's say that all of this happened, that, let's just say that this whole room decided that we were filing a complaint about what happened here. And um, where would be the oversight? Who is overseeing? First, you need standing. To file a complaint, you need okay. standing. You have right. to be the affected party. Okay, let's just assume we did have standing. Okay. So, okay, okay. Let, let, let's assume for a moment that somebody stopped you wearing a Homeland Security vest and demanded your identification, and you refused, and they decided to put their hands on you. That could lead to a complaint for abuse, abuse of power. And you'd have to basically file that complaint with the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Office of Inspector General in DC. Okay, so Congress has oversight of Homeland Security. Congress gives them their budget, so they have ultimate oversight, yes. Okay. Where does the Department of Commerce come in? It has nothing to do with immigration. But why are these uh, ill people, these sick people, having their visas revoked? Why is it coming from the Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross? What visas are being revoked? The ones that are here on medical programs that have the medical waivers to be in the U.S. I was listening to this okay. the other night, and they and Wilbur Ross who is Secretary of Commerce, is the one who came in and said they are revoking their visas. The ones who are here for medical treatment. First of all, there is no visa for medical treatment. That's a misnomer. Anybody wanting to seek entry to the United States from a foreign country who's not from a country that already has an agreement with the United States called a visa waiver has to apply for a visa at a U.S. consulate or U.S. embassy. If you are not a student, or coming in as a fiance or as the spouse of a US citizen, the catch all is visitor for pleasure, tourist visa. A tourist visa can be granted to somebody who is coming to seek medical attention if they can prove to the consular official that the medical attention they're seeking is already prearranged, prepaid, and will not take a single penny from any taxpayer. That is the only way somebody enters the United States for medical treatment, period. No consular official is going to give a visitor visa to somebody seeking medical treatment unless the bill has already been paid. So the visa is not per se a medical visa. The visa is a visitor visa that's been granted on the condition that they come in to seek the medical treatment and depart. So revocation, after the fact is kind of a misnomer too, because if they've already gotten the visa, they've already proven that they've already prepaid the medical. So the Department of Commerce has no real reason to go after the financial aspect of the situation. I guess I don't understand why they are deporting these people. And there's a slew, I was watching the congressional hearings yesterday. Okay. There's a slew of them, and they testified that they're being sent home before the end of their medical treatment, and it was through the Department of Commerce, and that's where well, I but, got confused. But the Department of Commerce has no deportation authority. Okay. Department of Commerce can suggest to another agency that these people are going to become a public charge. So that is kind of... It's kind of underhanded to say, look, I'm not going to let you in unless you've already paid for your medical yeah. treatment, but now that you're here, I think you're going to end up using some other money, so that's the reason I'm going to send you home. Okay. But it, the deportation would have to come from Department of Homeland Security. That's where it would start. It would probably be at the suggestion of Congress. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, could, 
Could we go back and I just to clarify something about the guest worker program? You said it was capped at 68. Now, are, are you saying that if there, there was no cap, that then we wouldn't have the problem with people? That, it's, it's 68,000, I take it, is a very tiny, minuscule. Think, think, think about how many people it takes to cultivate all the vegetables that we eat on yeah, a daily basis. Right. It's just not enough, right? <laughs> so, For the, the entire food supply in the, the entire United States, we're not, we're not going to have 68,000 people doing all the picking. So what needs to happen is that that number needs to be exponential. What, what, what needs to happen is that our members of Congress have to look at the problem from both sides of the fence. Is there a need to cut down on people entering illegally? Of course, because illegal entries have, have been taken over by the drug cartels in Mexico. They've become essentially the way that people can come into the United States. And are there tons of abuses? Absolutely. So by making somebody have only one option to sneak across illegally, we're subjecting them to all kinds of abuses by the criminals running and smuggling. But if we sat down and said, look, we're going to pass a, a, a legislative uh, enactment that creates 600,000 visas per year for agricultural workers who have no criminal records, and they're permitted to come to the United States for a nine-month maximum period, and they have to depart every year on time. How many people do you think would be lining up at the USMC and CDA where it's to apply for that? That depends on comprehensive immigration reform, which we're stuck at. But that, that, this is common sense because this is not addressing illegal entries. This is creating an avenue for people to come here, contribute to the community and the, the commerce, and still feed their families back home. He don't, he don't want common sense. He wants rapists and, and murderers. And but murderers. but let's let's not limit this to he. Right. You you have two U.S. senators. Yeah. You have one representative. Yeah. These are the individuals making law. He is the enforcement <clears throat> official, not the legislator. So it comes about us lobbying the people we elect. Um. So. When talking about this issue, some people need it. Some people don't. Okay. Okay. When talking about this issue, can you speak to this uh, the argument that um, illegal immigrants come, take all of the jobs, suck up welfare money, they're taking all of our tax public tax dollars, and then not contributing anything to it? Okay. I, I would like to hear your thoughts on this. <laughs> okay. Arguments. And I will apologize because I can't defend immigrants for 16 years and not have a, a viewpoint. Okay. Um, first of all, if you walk into any benefit provider like Job and Family Services, if you do not have proof that you were born in the United States or a naturalized citizen, can you obtain welfare, Section 8 housing? or Medicaid for yourself. Not under any circumstance. Correct. You cannot apply for a benefit unless you have proof that you're a US citizen. Now, if an individual who was born in a foreign country has a child who's born in the United States, still under the 14th Amendment, which exists today, it's birthright citizenship. That US citizen child has a right to all the benefits we just mentioned. Can a six-month-old child go to Job and Family Services and fill out the application? Now, so who goes in to fill out the application? The parent, who might be visibly Hispanic, not speak English. Does that mean they're taking welfare? No. Does that mean the U.S. citizen who's eligible for welfare is taking it? Yes. So, like any U.S. citizen child, if you fall on hard times, you have the right to take these federal benefits. But the parent is not the one applying for, receiving, or in most cases, benefiting. Because if the benefit happens to be something like um, Medicaid, that's unique to the user. 
Okay. Number two, if somebody enters the United States illegally, there's multiple ways to find work. One way to find work is to work for somebody who just pays cash. You don't have to show a single document to you. But if you want to get a job at Dole or any other big employer, what do you have to do? You have to go to the street and you have to find somebody who prints up a photo ID and a social security number. Why is that? Who was the last person in this room that ever filled out an I-9 form? Okay, what do they ask for on the I-9? Two forms of ID. One from list A, one from list B. <laughs> and if you show these two pieces of information, they're going to fill out the form. They're going to say, you facially look like you're eligible to work. Here's the job. So what does the average person coming from a foreign country who's here illegally do? Do they go and do they assume the identity of a US citizen? It's very difficult, number one, and it's a federal felony. The easiest thing to do is to go to somebody who just prints up invented social security numbers and gives you a fake looking green card or work permit that HR at Dole is not going to know the difference about. So the average person who's here working illegally is working under a completely invented social security number that does not exist. And every year when they have their withholdings taken out, can they fill out a 1040 with a social security number that doesn't exist? No. So what happened to all those withholdings? Who's got them? The whole does. The gov no. The withholding taxes that you paid the federal, state, and county. The government still has them. No one has taken anything back out for that number because the number doesn't even exist. The federal government's happy to take the withholdings off every single undocumented employee because employee, the money's never being redispersed. Go ahead. So you're saying the United States government keeps all of that money and benefits monetarily from keeping people in this situation? Well, I mean, I'm not saying that it's, it's to the point of a conspiracy, but are they happy to keep the money and not give a refund check? Absolutely. And of course, the average, the average illegal immigrant is too frightened to go and talk to a tax preparer, okay? So, you used to do this, right? You, get, you got the ITIN, right? Okay. So what normally happens is, you're working on the fake identity, which is invented, not stolen. You're, at the end of the year, your W-2 comes out with that social security number that doesn't exist. So if you actually want to file a tax return, you have to then file with the federal government and receive an uh, ITIN number, individual tax ID number, which permits you to then file a 1040. The problem is your W-2 doesn't match the ITIN. So you go to an unscrupulous guy who does taxes, and what he'll do is he'll actually black out on the W-2 with a heavy marker the original social security number, file your tax return with the ITIN number, and you might get a refund if you're lucky. But most people don't bother doing it. Can you explain why, why the employers are never sanctioned for hiring? I mean, the, the, the raids in, in Mississippi recently just exposed how, how totally corrupt it is. Why is it that they, they, they just don't, quote, know that this guy is illegal or is undocumented? They, they normally only know when they might be subject to something like a workers' comp claim or they might be subject to something like uh, organization in the form of labor unions. So most large employers only become aware of the illegality when the employee is creating a problem. Now we have a basis to fire them because now we do an audit on the I-9 and then we take that fake social security number and for the first time ever we put it in the e-verify system online and it comes back as fake, oh, we're firing you. So, did, you, did you ever hear of Case Farms that's up near Canton, Ohio? Mm -hmm. okay. Case Farms um, was poultry production, and Case Farms really heavily, heavily targeted 
Guatemalans who don't speak Spanish. For any of the history buffs in the room, in Central America, what country still has indigenous Maya languages? Guatemala. In Salvador, Honduras, the um, Spanish influence eradicated the original indigenous languages. Guatemala still has about 10 active indigenous Mayan languages, and people speak rudimentary Spanish. Well, that's who is being targeted by these poultry and uh, egg production in Ohio. Case Farms had a huge number of Guatemalans working, mainly from the Quiche and Quechaquil backgrounds. And when they started organizing with the help of some uh, gentlemen in Cleveland who wanted to put together a union, um, they started engaging in a union busting activity and began firing um, the organizers. And so um, when their bottom line was being hurt by organized labor, that's when they finally, oh, this number's fake. We're fired. Now, did that make the firing retaliatory for engaging in federally protected um, uh, activities? Yes. <laughs> and did the FBI and the Department of Justice get involved? Yes. And that's why Case Farms went down, is because of their union busting activities. But the, the short version is the, by pretending ignorance, they can charge obscenely low wages. Okay. And then anybody who raises a ruckus, they just out them, and that's the way that the system's maintained. If I'm, if I'm here using a fake Social Security number, am I going to go running to wage and labor if you offer me $6 an hour? No. I'm going to take it. I worked in the HR, this PHR certified, and worked in, um, as a senior trial paralegal for almost 25 years, and um, we had to use E-Verify to hire. So um, the question does become, what is happening to these employers that, you know, they may be um, attempting to turn a blind eye, but they are legally required to uh, run numbers through E-Verify. And then the other point is, is that, uh, because I had worked in the HR law, um, and I did workers' comp, and we had to know a lot of employment law. And so I would get different um, cases and read them in the O-bars and things like that. And one of the most egregious that I saw was a meat packing company that they had, some, somehow they were raided, and they were abusing the workers so bad that, because they were illegal, that they, there were reports that they had used hammers on them to correct their behavior. And um, I just think that you, that a lot of this is just the tip of the iceberg that we're seeing. And uh, with reference to what's happening at the border at this point in time, with the separation of children and caging children and things like that, um, I'm glad that this kind of stuff is actually being seen because I think it's causing the uh, appropriate outrage and action that needs to be taken because what you are talking about and what has been going on for a very long time, it's just been hidden away. But these employers need to be held accountable. And I, I agree with his question. What is happening there. You know, we need oversight of ICE, and we need, you know, um, we need these employers held accountable too, as well as, you know, to me, I I would be all for not even having a number of of you know, let's let's track how many are coming in, and you know put people through the clappers procedures and et cetera. And then that way, 
that would give us a more realistic idea of who is coming in, where they are going, what our actual economic needs are in this country, you know, and... What, what company did you do HR for? Was it a large employer? Montgomery County Juvenile Court. Okay. So, as a, as a government employer, E-Verify is required. But E-Verify is not required by private employers. It's there if they oh. want it. And, and they get away with this. Any, most uh, jobs in this country have background checks before you get into them. But E-Verify is only voluntary and after the fact because that serves the interest of Purdue or any of these big ag companies so that they don't, if they were held liable for do you, you must do at point of entry and E-Verify, then they could be held at sanction, but they don't want to be on the hook and they run the call, the, call the shots. It, the E-Verify system is essentially voluntary. So outside of government employment, where you have to verify. Because in certain government jobs, you have to be a citizen, not a green card holder, or you have to be a green card holder, not a work permit holder, to hold certain government jobs. Private employment's not like that. So E-Verify exists if employers will want to use it. And so most employers know that if they do use it, their workforce is going to dwindle. So I'm not going to use it until it becomes mandated. That's, and, and so are there, are there legit sanctions for the employer? Not really. The, the sanction is you lose the employee. Um, I have a question for, say you were to come in illegally and you were for some reason able to like obtain an application for any kind of visa, but you're, because your visa is going through a process right now, which takes a long time, you're still technically not legal in this country, and you're stopped by an ICE officer. So, do you still recommend doing the same thing, remaining silent, even though you know you're in a process that could lead to a visa? It, it depends on which process you're in. So, there are plenty of processes, like the DACA program that President Obama started. Okay, so every person that entered at a certain age who uh, attained a certain education could file for a deferred status of deportability. That's what DACA is. So all these individuals every 18 months have to be fingerprinted, have to go through a background check. So is it worthwhile for them on a stop and search to remain silent? No, because they've been fingerprinted multiple times and we know their identity. The people that need to remain silent are the people that have never once been fingerprinted by the federal government. And this is what generally happens at the border. When you're at the Mexican border, on any given night, the individuals who are crossing illegally, border control can only catch someone. So if you're caught right there at the border by the border patrol on their ATVs or their SUVs, those agents have the ability to process you for deportation, or they can give you something called a voluntary return. If you're literally right on the line, they'll print you, they'll take a digital photo, and they'll just kick you back over to the Mexican side. That voluntary return, though, resulted in a biometric capture. So if I have somebody in the state of Ohio who I know has never had a biometric capture at the border, remaining silent is the way to go. But even if you've had that one interdiction at the border where there's a biometric capture, remaining silent's worthless because they can print you. And there is a record that in 2008, you were captured at Brownsville. And there's the information you gave the ICE officer sitting there at the border. So certain people, it is effective. Individuals who are waiting for legit status have no reason to lie. Does that answer the question? Okay. And it really depends on what the person is applying for, too. Because there's all kinds of other things besides DACA. Okay. Um, 
Are there any other topics that are of great interest? Anybody else? Uh, what's the uh, sanctuary city and how? How do you how do you become one? We're we're going to pass out a little overview of sanctuary cities, and a sanctuary city is not something that is a legal definition. A sanctuary city is essentially something where a subdivision of a state, it can be a county, it can be a city, it can be a municipality, it can be a township, chooses to not, not assist when federal agencies make requests. So the handout that's coming around if you look towards the bottom of it, under the universal definition does not exist. It talks about something called the 287G agreement. Immigration Nationality Act 287G is the authority for a state official to be given federal powers solely under the Immigration Act. So there will be some municipalities, states, counties, etc., where ICE agents will go in and specifically give training to local officers so they understand what they're looking for, what they can and cannot do. And so if that same political subdivision, the, the people that hire those officers choose to pass at the local level a policy, essentially legislation, that we're not going to permit our, our employees to do anything on the federal side. That's normally how sanctuary cities are created. Okay, Columbus, Ohio, where I practice and live, is a sanctuary city. So Columbus, Ohio is governed by Columbus Police, but we sit within Franklin County. So if one of my clients, who's illegal, no license, gets stopped for not having a license, Columbus police will ticket them and release them. County sheriff is not obligated to follow the city of Columbus policy because they're not city employees. So the sheriff's department will do the exact opposite. They'll hold them and they'll call the local ICE officers to come down and interview them. If the person being stopped has no license, has no social security number, and speaks with a heavy accent. So a sanctuary city is created at the local level by legislation, which is either going to be your city council, your, you know, whatever. If this begs the question of what we all just experienced, and I'm, you're probably familiar with what we just went through with, with Miguel, and the fact that our local council, or our local, because we are a small municipality, don't have the right of the prosecutor and, the, and that legal system it ended up getting turned over to so, so there's effectively no way to be a sanctuary city unless you have that legal legislative power to to act independent correct correct you you don't create a sanctuary city after the fact but but i'm saying that regardless i mean we don't have the ability because we are not independent in the sense of having a legal system, Yellow Springs, Ohio, is so too small to have that. So therefore, anybody who gets transferred to a larger agency is now out of our control. The, the Columbus can do what it can do because it has the legal maybe, ability. Maybe, maybe it would help to look at it from this perspective. Normally, the only time it's helpful to be a sanctuary city is if you are also the place where people are initially detained right. for a crime. Does Yellow Springs have its own jail? No. So they transport to a county. Okay. So it's going to be the county sheriff who's going to receive the written detainer request from ICE, exactly. not the local police. So if the local police arrest somebody on a crime, if it's an arrestable offense, and they have to be arrested under Ohio Revised Code, they're going to be turned over to a larger area 
which now becomes a county issue, not a local issue. So you just agreed with what I just said? Not necessarily, because if if the, if they're not if you're not housing prisoners here, there's no way to make the sanctuary situation even helpful. That's right. So being a sanctuary doesn't help right. unless you also are where the county jail is located. Exactly. Okay. We're saying the same thing in different words. Yes. <clears throat> Okay, so did someone else, did you have a question? No, no. Okay. Right. Thank you. So can only cities be sanctuary or can counties, can a county government come together and say, we're sanctuary? They, they, they could. If, they oh. have, if, if a county has the ability to legislate for the county proper, Yes, I mean, because remember, we're in Ohio, and I'm I'm only a licensed Ohio attorney. I don't know if counties in Pennsylvania have the ability to pass laws or Florida or whatever. But normally in the state of Ohio, legislation is made at the city level, the state level. There's no intermediate county legislation. So it, it basically going to be our our elected representatives going to propose a bill in the city council and then vote on it. Okay, then I have a question about county taxes because they don't the county commissioners get together and they create that law sure, well, with they, reference they, they, to commissioners are elected representatives. Yes. But commissioners don't have legislative authority. They they have the ability to spend, not to not to create a new tax. Okay. Taxation comes from the state or the city, not from the county level. Okay, so but they, they can use the money that's given to them by the municipalities within the county. Okay, but they can but they can get together and set the county tax rate, correct? No. Mm. No. We're yes. Getting, we're getting a little bit of feel of what I normally do. Oh, okay. <laughs> because so. I was just thinking that that I think that they create some laws, but you're saying that no, they just implement them. Right, that county officials generally do not have the ability to create legislation. You, okay, think about it like this. Um, if I'm stopped today for a crime, I'm either going to be charged under the city code or the Ohio Revised Code. If I'm stopped for no license, there is a local city code that governs having a license, and there's the state law that governs having a license. So if I'm stopped in a large municipality, they're going to charge me under the Ohio Revised Code. If I'm stopped in a smaller municipality, I'm charged under the city code, or the police officer could charge me under the Ohio Revised Code. But there's no county code. But don't they have, like, county jails? And yeah. Jails county. are just housing facilities, though. Yeah. And the counties are where we prosecute, <clears throat> we prosecute at the county-level felonies. And normally, the county has a court that deals with felonies. It's just a division. It's not necessarily where laws are passed. So from a code perspective, a law perspective, codes exist in the municipality level and at the state level. So is the None state level? None at the county level. None that I'm aware of. So it's up to ultimately a city council to propose and vote in the democratic process to pass a law. And if that law is we're not going to allow our city officials to interact this way with the federal government, that becomes law in that city. It becomes obscure, but I mean, don't, don't counties have zoning laws? But those laws, zoning, are normally passed at the state level. And they're just enforcing the oh, okay. okay. Could you translate the sort of know your rights information um, to like a sort of a college campus context? For example, it's like, you know, not opening the door, you know, does that apply, you know, like for your dorm room or like how does it sort of translate? Yeah, well, it's the same thing going back to the very beginning that we're dealing with civil law. So these agents, the ICE agents, have to voluntarily get in. So they don't have, they don't have overarching police authority. 
if they if they suspect a crime is happening, they can take further steps under exigent circumstances. It doesn't exist for ICE. So they can knock all they want, they can yell and scream all they want, but going back to the regulation discussion we had at the beginning, an ICE agent only enforces Title VIII of the U.S. Code. Title VIII of the U.S. Code is then prescribed in regulations. Their authority ends at those regulations. They can't go beyond them. They're not here to search for drugs. They're not here to search for guns. That's the DEA and the ATF. Their job is only to determine if I suspect somebody crossed the border illegally and are here illegally, am I investigating that? Help me understand. It's clear in an apartment building, for example, that each unit becomes the deciding factor. I mean, if I open my apartment door, then I am doing certain things. What was unclear when you brought that up is a student in a dorm, who has the ability to allow them into the dorm, or is it the dorm room that becomes the relevant it's, factor? It's going to depend on the makeup of the building. So if you have public access to the dormitory until 9 p.m., they can get past the main door, as like any other member of the public. So it just depends on what we're... Some dormitories, when I was in college ages ago, the dormitories were open to the public up until a certain hour, and then the doors were locked and only residents could get at the main door. At that uh, up until that time, then it's up to the students to say, um, go away, no thank you, right. or whatever. If, if, I mean, if, at his or her door. If, if the door. officer is coming to your abode, let's look at it that way. You, you reside in the building, but your abode is your room. Okay, okay. I'm just trying to be clear. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so my question is, what about um, public spaces that are private businesses, but the public has access to, like a hotel, where the kitchen staff, it happens to be a kitchen, the back of the house is full of undocumented workers. Somebody, an ICE agent comes in. They are, they are able to inquire and ask, what is your status? Can they be asked to leave because they're on private property? This is all, again, okay, so hypothetical. The, you know, the employees get together and talk to the employer, and the employer agrees that if ICE agents come onto the property, they can be asked to leave, or is it better that everybody just shuts up? It's better to let them do their thing mm -hmm. and don't and just don't talk because you don't want to you don't want to poke a sleeping bear. Right. Okay. That makes sense. So, advise everyone of the need to not carry identification mm -hmm. and the need to remain completely silent. It's not an affront to the ICE officer to say, "I don't want to answer your questions." Gotcha. I refuse. Brian, on this type of situation, Mike. On this ID situation, I'm wondering with the, the states that have provisional driver's license or limited purpose driver's license, have you seen anything where ICE is using that as the... No, and I, I see people every now and then coming in with still valid Michigan licenses because Michigan was a little bit more um, uh, anti-Real um, ID Act up until lately. And there are some other jurisdictions, but I've never seen that used as a way for the federal government to track individuals. And that, and I mean, think about it now. Why is it that we're switching over to that federal ID? Has anyone applied for that new federal ID yet? Mm -hmm. Did you notice that when you're at the license bureau, before you take the generic picture with a nice backdrop, they take another picture with a small black camera that uploads immediately to a DHS computer? That's what they're doing. So the new federal ID is doing a capture of your, of your face that's being taken directly to a federal computer, and then you sit for your normal driver's license photo. 
And on, in 2022, unless you have one of these federal IDs, you will not get that TSA. Okay. No, not that one. That's You're small, small one. You have DACA. I you can't get a federal one. No, 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 no. It's not like it's picture <laughs> right sure. at the top. No, no, no. It's okay. No, they actually take an extra photo oh, digitally while picture. you're standing at the booth. Go ahead. Okay. So yeah. if you don't have real ID, because right now the state I live in, Pennsylvania, is enforcing real ID, because my ID right now says not used for real ID, I can't get past TSA. It, it, at some point in time, yes. You need two they, forms. They've, they've rolled it out as a gradual thing. So we've been told in Ohio that 2022, unless your Ohio license or Ohio ID is the federally mandated ID, you can no longer use that as a form of ID for TSA. But you can still use a U.S. passport. I, I, I carry a U.S. passport card because I travel to Detroit so much, I always like to go across the bridge to Gannon. So I think it's always in my wallet. Now, it's a U.S. passport, but it's a plastic card with a microchip. So if I need to go past TSA, I just show them that. I want to go back to what Carmen's scenario of the restaurant with the workers and you indicated that advise them you know not to carry um so is it your opinion that managers supervisors and employers can advise workers not to bring id and not to answer questions and be in compliance with um laws you're, you're complying essentially with the constitutional right to remain silent Okay. <laughs> so, um, has anyone in this in this room ever been an immigrant? Besides you. Okay. Has anyone taken the citizenship test? Okay. Of the hundred questions, there's a question on there that says, "What is the U.S. Constitution? What's the answer?" It is the law of the land. I remember that. So, remember, the Constitution still applies. So you can advise, you, I, I have no problem advising people. If you are confronted by law enforcement, your right to remain silent is absolute. It, the, the problem. I know that when you're stopped by police officers, they have to learn that. I'm sorry. Um, we've asked her, but my- It's not going to be so soft Sorry. That's no problem. Um, do Miranda rights apply to people being stopped by ICE? No, um, because it's not you're not being booked on a criminal act. So there's no there's no right to Miranda. There is also no right to free legal services if you are stopped and placed in deportation proceedings. When you get to immigration court for the first time, the judge tells you you have a right to counsel of your own choosing, but you will not get a free lawyer. Wow, civil law. It's, it would be like you getting a free lawyer to do a divorce. County's not going to give you that. <laughs> so, so all these old folks who are getting picked up are, and don't have any money. You know, most do not have attorney kind of money. So they're just SOL unless there is a, you know, one in a thousand chance of a pro bono. I want to say something real quick. Um, some do have attorney money, but they don't have the knowledge to use the money that's in the house in the diaper drawer, right? And so there's no liaison between, there's no way to get to that, that lawyer money. Does that make sense? Right. And there's and no bank account, but there's $6,000 okay. in I, the freezer. I get that. Right? And, and many folks don't even have the diaper drawer money. Well. Right. I, I don't know. I mean, that was not that was that wasn't my experience. I, that wasn't I my experience in, here for a second? in Springfield. Can I? Okay. The can money I, was there. There was just no way to get. Can to I? Money. Can I give you some reality? Okay. Most people who are arrested by ICE and are taken to Butler Jail and held for immigration proceedings, the majority of them are not going to post bond. The reason is that in an immigration bond proceeding, it's not the same as a criminal court where the presumption of innocence applies. You're in a civil proceeding. In a bond hearing with an immigration judge, an immigration judge is not 
a federal judge. An immigration judge is a hearing examiner hired by the Department of Justice. They are not federal judges. In that hearing, the regulations say the judge can look at any evidence of danger to the community and flight risk. They can look at accusations. They can look at a police complaint that has not been found beyond a reasonable doubt and guilt has been prescribed to that individual. So when I get to a bond hearing with somebody who's recently detained, real world example, domestic violence. Okay, my guy is sitting in Butler County. He has a domestic violence in, I don't know, Hamilton, Ohio. He hasn't been convicted yet. But the police report says that the female in the, in the house, the mother of the children, was struck in the face multiple times with a closed fist. When I get to the bond hearing, the immigration judge is going to be handed that police report and that affidavit by the government attorney. And they're going to say, you know what? You look kind of dangerous to me. I'm not giving you a bond. So there's no presumption of innocence. Doesn't exist. It's the, 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 there's no evidentiary rules. In, in the state of Ohio, a first time OVI, state minimum penalty for driving under the influence, state minimum for a first offense is three days in jail or three days in a driver intervention program and a maximum penalty of $375 plus court costs. That's the maximum penalty for an OVI. But if an individual gets an OVI and they happen to also be undocumented, after they've done their three days in jail, they get whisked away to immigration. And the immigration judge is going to say, driving with a point two BAC with the kid's seat in the back is dangerous behavior. I'm going to hold you without bond. So what the state criminalized with three days in jail, they get penalized for 30, 40, 60 days sitting in ICE custody before they decide either to just sign a deportation and go or try to hire a lawyer from sitting in custody. That's reality. So the average person sitting in ICE custody, that $6,000 isn't going to do much for them if they can't get out of jail. But if they can't even communicate that the money is there, that's another hurdle. Here's where it gets really, really realistic, shockingly realistic. If I'm picked up and I'm sitting in ICE custody and I know I'm not getting out and I know I'm going to be on the next flight to the border, why do I want my family wasting that money when I need the eight grand to be smuggled back in the country? Because I'm just going to come right back. And 10 years ago, it cost like two grand to get smuggled in. Now the coyotes at the border are charging at least eight or nine thousand dollars. So so if I'm sitting in ICE custody and I know I'm going to be deported anyway, why do I want to throw six, seven grand at a lawyer here just to prolong it? Send me home and I'll be back in a week. Because that money is more effective paying the smuggler. Or supporting the family. Yeah. But that's how they're going to support their families, by smuggling back in so they can go right back to work. But that's real. People sitting in ICE custody are not thinking like you and I, having grown up on cop shows, seeing, you know, Dragnet or whatever, you know, generation. Initially, you told all of us that the laws have not changed in about 50 years, okay? Um, so 50 years would be back in the 60s, okay, that these laws that we are now, uh, that now cover everything were created. Um, so before these laws were created back in the 60s, was it this harsh and inhumane and unjust and unfair? Were the laws like this? Or in the 1960s, did, did the laws 
become so slanted and profane it's, to, it seems to me, the underlying foundation there, of the there, There's States. two things at play here. The laws affecting legal immigration are one side of the argument. The laws of how we treat illegal immigrants are different. So if we want to talk about how we legally affect immigration, back in the 60s, it was easier to get an unskilled green card for somebody who did not have a bachelor's degree. Stonemasons, carpenters, people like that in the 50s and 60s could come from a foreign country and get a green card through employment sponsorship because we still wanted non-degreed labor types. In about the 1980s, Congress created so many hurdles to bring non-degreed individuals that today, to get status through employment, you either have to have a bachelor's degree and go to the Department of Labor to sample the labor market before you're going to be certified to get your job, or you have to be a PhD with so many publications that you are the top of your skill set in the world. So the laws affecting legal immigration have basically gone from we don't need any more blue collar people, we've already built our infrastructure, now we only want white collar. Okay, but my question is, is that 50 years ago, what we're dealing with now, is what you said that the laws, so the laws are there 50 years ago. Prior to that, were they this um, terrible? From, from an enforcement perspective, back then, the answer was no. You could talk to people whose parents remember crossing at Brownsville without showing anything, just to go shopping on the Texas side, and then just go back over the same day with <coughs> their shopping bags. But today, post 9-11, if you want to cross the US border, you have to go through biometric scan, you have to go through presenting a lawful visa, and you have to have a machine readable passport. Didn't exist pre 9 11. You ever, you, ever, you ever gone over to Canada before 9 11? Sure. On the yeah. way back in, what are the guys in the US side? No, you're from Ohio? Yeah, come on back. Now they ask you questions. Now, now you have to actually present a passport to get back in. So, so, based on your answer, what you just said, even though the laws were this way for 50 years, the interpretation and the implementation were very different pre-9-11, post-9-11. Pre-9-11, our borders were not manned very well. Pre-9-11, um, does anyone here know what a student visa is? An F-1 student visa. Coming to the United States to complete a course of study. The course of study could be an entire bachelor's, it could be bachelor's, master's, bachelor's, master's, PhD, or any combination thereof. When you come into the United States as an F1, you have to be approved by the college to get in. You have to go to the embassy and get a visa. You show up in the United States, and six months into it, you run out of money. What happens? You don't leave. 9-11. How many of the people flying those planes were F1 overstays? Most of them. Most of them. After 9-11, the United States government immediately change the F-1 program. They didn't do anything to affect border security or how people cross at land borders, but they immediately completely revamped the entire F-1 system. They put in a brand new supercomputer called the SEVIS, S-E-V-I-S system, and now every school has a SEVIS official, and if the F-1 student does not show up for the next semester or quarter, within X many days, they get canceled from SEVIS, and Homeland Security is on their doorstep within days. Where's that? About a bail? Do people usually, if they get bail, if they pay it, do they get that money back? Yes. So unlike the criminal justice system where a bond is normally at 10%, where the bond company takes 10%, collateral, puts up 10%, the rest goes on to insurance policy. Immigration bonds are dollar for dollar. So if an immigrant is told by the judge in Cleveland, I'm setting your bond at $8,000, 
I have to send the family in with $8,000 in government money orders. Whenever their case reaches its logical conclusion, as long as they comply with every order of the immigration court, and if that order is to eventually leave the country, the money is returned with interest, and you only get a 1098 on the interest. So they tax the interest. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Does that happen? Oh, yeah. I, I, had, a, I had a guy from uh, Guinea who bonded in 2005 on a $15,000 bond down in Maryland. They revoked his bond here in Ohio in like 2013, and he got a check for 17 grand. Okay, can you explain why it's civil? Like, immigration is a legal thing. Why is it not a legal it, issue? Why is it a civil it, it was. It was the way our legislature wrote the Immigration Nationality Act to begin with. They wrote it without a criminal component. Now, Title Eight governs how we become green card holders, how we become citizens, how we get temporary visas, and it also governs who is permitted to enter legally or be excluded. So all of that comes from a body of law that dates back to like the 1840s. So they've just kept, they, they, they just keep adding things on without truly revamping the process. So trust me, when I go to an immigration law conference, the one thing we all wish for is legit judges to have our immigration cases heard by the federal judiciary. We love that, but we don't get it, thanks to Congress. But it, it's, it's considered civil in nature because the penalty is not one of loss of liberty. This, this is the catch. The, the penalty is deportation. The loss of liberty happens while you're waiting. It's pre-trial custody. Does that help? It's depressing. <laughs> it is. It's <laughs> I mean, I see it as a loss of liberty to be deported. But while you're waiting for deportation, you could be sitting in a jail cell for six months. Is that the next? No, you can. I, I've had guys that have been stuck for four or five years who just refuse to stop appealing their case. So, I mean, we're not we're not a government that has chose to legislate in a humane way when it comes to immigration and. Remember, the laws exist, but it's the current executive who determines how we enforce. Okay? President Obama said, I'm going to take this entire group of children who Congress has not seen fit to pass a law to cover, and I'm going to use my executive authority to say these people cannot be deported. It's not unprecedented. We have temporary protected status for certain countries that have had natural disasters or wars. Sierra Leone had TPS for many, many years during their civil war. Liberia, TPS. El Salvador has TPS. Somalia has TPS. Sudan had TPS. When they ended the TPS program for Liberia, when Liberia finally had a legitimate election, you know what the United States government did? They canceled the TPS program but they instituted a new program called Deferred Enforcement of Deportation, which is essentially deferred action. So not a single Liberian who's been here since the 80s can be deported, even though they're no longer in status. We pick and choose. Brian, I have one question. <laughs> on, the, on the front end, in straight talk, straight, straight talk, what can we do with our family, friends, and loved ones to help educate them to stay out of harm's way? And what can we do to help them obtain citizenship, if anything? And that, that's the big problem, is it doesn't exist. Any person who's come across the border illegally, that right there is a prohibition to lawful status. Yeah. So entering without inspection prohibits the ability to get lawful status at all. Multiple recidivist illegal entries 
If you enter illegally today, you spend one year or more unlawfully in the United States. You voluntarily return and re-enter illegally time number two. You've just triggered a lifetime bar to any immigration benefit. It's called the recidivist bar. So we really can't counsel our friends and family that, well, just go do it the right way. To go do it the right way, if you've crossed illegally one time and you've triggered that one year of unlawful presence, if you do decide to leave and want to reapply legally to come back, you are already subject to a 10 year bond. Does that, does that count if you had a student visa and you didn't? report at a set time. That, that, now we're getting into some really good esoteric stuff. <laughs> student visas, when you're stamped in at the board or you're not stamped in for a certain date, when you're stamped on a student visa, they endorse the I-94 or the stamp D slash S, which stands for duration of status, because your course of, you might transfer to college number two and do a PhD course, which you didn't contemplate to begin with. So duration of status continues as long as you are attending school. As long as you have proof that you are. As you're yeah. enrolled. Okay. Now, where it gets really confusing is that as a deportation attorney, the case law says that if my client entered with a DS admission, duration of status, they are considered in status until they're discovered to be out of status. So if they stopped going to school 20 years ago, but immigration doesn't figure it out until today, they're not considered a status violator until the day they're discovered. Okay. It doesn't date back to the violation. But that's the rarity of F1, J1, and M1 visas. But that counts still as a strike against them, right? Once they're discovered, no, once they're discovered, yes. But okay. now that we discover the person who's an F1 overstay, they only begin accruing unlawful presence today. So if they leave in 179 days, they have no prohibition on coming back through some other method. Uh, okay. So now, is no, we have more questions. <laughs> Before we, did I, did I, I got the second half. The so first half. The first half, is it more so from the perspective of what we want to do in public? Any advice, tips? Uh, in, Anybody, anybody in this room who knows somebody who might be undocumented, you're doing nothing wrong by being their friend, by hanging out with them, by advising them, by assisting them. The best thing you can do is make sure the person who's undocumented is being driven by a licensed driver and make sure they don't drink heavily in public. Because the two ways that people get caught the most are driving without a license and OBI. So if you want to be a friend to your community and you know somebody might be undocumented, you make sure that they're always being driven by a licensed driver and they don't get anywhere near a controlled substance or influence and operation of a motor vehicle. Because once you're turned over to immigration, any DUI related offense is considered dangerousness to the community by every single judge we have here in Ohio. And you're not getting bonded out. You're not getting bonded out if you have a DUI. If you have a DUI in Ohio, the seven judges we have in Cleveland, the rare the rare ones will be somebody who's done like some AA courses, maybe I'll get a $15,000 bond, if I'm lucky. Mm. Um, I was going to ask, um, can, you speak to, can you speak to how that, um, how that crosses over with people applying for asylum, or people who are already here applying for asylum? Okay, so the asylum business has changed over the years. It used to be that people would come here with visas from places that are bad or dangerous, and then apply for asylum after arriving legally. But our law also permits a process at the border where any person who presents themselves at the border who requests asylum has to be screened in a process called the credible fear interview. In the credible fear interview, an asylum officer who is a separate branch of Department of Homeland Security, asylum officers have training in how to deal with 
refugees. If you present yourself at the border, at um, I don't know, Brownsville or San Ysidro, and you just walk right up to the border and say, I'm seeking asylum. You're taken into custody, and then you're given one of these interviews, and then you're released pending an immigration hearing in court. So those people, if they get in trouble at the state level, their terms of release from the border will be altered. They were released with the intent to go to immigration court and fight their asylum case. But during that period of time, you have to comply with local law. So a lot of times people get released from the border, they're not paying a bond, they have a relatively legit asylum claim, but then years waiting for their immigration court hearing, they get picked up on something stupid, and they get taken into ICE custody. Now they're just like every other person in ICE custody because while they were here waiting for their hearing, they should have been complying with the norms of society. And you can't, you wouldn't be able to be here already and apply for asylum. You would have to. Correct. Asylum begins at the border, and if you're determined credible, you're released for further processing. If you're deemed not credible, you're on the next flight back. Does anybody have any more questions for Brian? I do. Given the situation that you are all hearing at this point in time, Given the situation that um, the immigration laws and behaviors and et cetera, where do you think that the people who want change, where, where would you recommend that we um, strike first? You know, what would be um, our best strategy? Aside from lobbying your members of Congress and your senators, there's nothing else you can do proactively. Because the ICE officers operate by their own clock. And they don't take kindly to people getting in their way. So we need to make sure that we're registered to vote and that we vote and that we go to town halls <coughs> and that we ask the pointed questions of what are your stances on and maybe even have um, local stories and et cetera and ask for specific answers regarding scenarios. Absolutely. Our, our one benefit in this constitutional republic is that we do elect our legislators by direct election, not like the presidential election. That's why we're a constitutional republic, not a democracy. Because we don't direct elect a president, so we can't be classified as a democracy. <clears throat> that was not a test. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we've got to get our legislators involved. And the problem we have is that what do we all know about our legislators? Do they listen to us first or do they listen to lobbyists first? The lobbyists. Because you and I don't have the, 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 the economic clout to make a big contribution to affect something. So it's got to come from grassroots organization. It's got to come from getting people knowledgeable. I'm hoping people left here today having a better understanding of what it's like to be in the shoes of somebody who ran across the southern border. Because the, the life is completely different from what we know. And you also, could you also um, explain that you don't get automatic citizenship or marriage? Yeah. If you are, if you enter the United States legitimately with a visa, and you are inspected by an immigration officer, if you marry a U.S. citizen two days later, you get a green card. But if you entered without inspection, and you marry a U.S. citizen, even on a vacation, if you enter without inspection, okay. no visa. Okay no inspection at the border. If I apply for a green card based on marriage, the first thing I have to attach is the proof of inspection. 
a stamp in the passport showing that they were admitted by an immigration officer at the border. So of the people in the United States who are most affected by immigration, the majority of them entered without inspection. If they're married to a US citizen, they cannot apply for a green card because they did not enter legally. If they want to get a green card through marriage, and if they've been in the United States for greater than one year illegally, they can process their green card at Ciudad Juarez or Santa Ana or Guatemala City at the US Embassy, but they're subject to that 10 year bar. Is there an exception for children? For if children enter without, without inspection? Uh, yes. If, if a child comes in without inspection, they don't they don't begin accruing unlawful presence until after age 18. So if you if you meet a child who entered unlawfully and there's a possibility for them, you got to get them out of the country before age 18 because then they could lawfully re-enter. We actually dealt with this many years ago. I, I work for some or I assist with some um, uh, immigrant projects in the Canton area that deal with a lot of migrant workers. And whenever we had the children of illegals who came illegally, but were showing promise in school. If we got them out before their 18th birthday, they could come back in on an F1 visa and go to college because they have no unlawful presence. Mm. Okay. Anything else? Do you see any backlash or, I'm sorry. Mm. Any backlash or pitfalls with uh, aspiring to being a sanctuary city? If you're not getting a lot of federal money already, it's not like the federal government can really penalize you at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing is this, because sanctuary city is not clearly defined, if, if a city theoretically were to run a campaign of simple signatures and if the majority of the city felt that the local constabulary should not honor any federal requests on the immigration side the will of the people is being mm -hmm. dealt with because remember the constabulary is not avoiding all federal they're just avoiding this civil issue if the DEA wants to talk to you about a Hispanic guy who they suspect is MS-13 and running cocaine, that's different. They're not immigration. That's a, that's a criminal investigation. <laughs> so when it comes to enforcement of civil laws, does the constabulary want to muddy the waters and say, I'm going to assist these guys who only have a regulatory mandate, mm -hmm. not a law enforcement mandate? I think that's up for the citizens to decide. All right. Does anybody else have any more questions? Okay. Because you were talking about you were talking about that gun deferred action, but how children don't acquire unlawful presence until after the age of eighteen. But yet DACA was granted for children for deferred action. DACA was created if you had entered by a certain age and had not aged out by a certain year and had completed school. But deferred action is not lawful presence. Deferred action is merely, we are not going to enforce our deportation laws against you. Mm -hmm. So it's an executive decision on enforcement. It's not lawful status granted by Congress like a green card is or like a student visa is. That's by act of law. So DACA, D DACA can still be renewed, but if you commit one of the crimes that is an exclusion to DACA, your DACA is going to be stripped and you're going to be placed in removal proceedings. Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up there is some literature here that I want to pass out and I also um, well first of all thank you Antioch and thank you um, Brian for coming
The other thing that I'm going to say is if you're interested in the organizational aspect of Help Us Make a Nation, please put your um, email address on my raggedy notebook and I will um, give you information regarding um, meetings. Right now we're in the process of revising the original bylaws for human and we're going to be taking a look at those and people are going to have um, the ability to, to help us vote on those bylaws. So that's the notebook. Thanks, everybody.